Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, yes, so my name's Rosie. Um, as Caitlin said, I'm working between geography and statistics. Um, I'm a first year PhD student, and today I'm just going to talk about some of the things I've been doing in my project. Uh, so just for a bit of background, um, ice sheets are important to understand because they are important for predicting future sea level rise. Numerical modelling of ice sheets can be a good tool to help us recreate ice sheets and um, see what they'll look like in future. Paleo ice sheets, which are ice sheets that now no longer exist, um, such as the one I will be studying, have left behind a huge wealth of physical evidence that indicate their past behaviour. This uh, evidence is currently underutilised in modelling efforts and is something that we are hoping to include in our numerical model. Um, I'll be looking at the Eurasian ice sheet, which is the white outline on the right hand side of the screen. Um, this is a reconstruction of said ice sheet approximately 21,000 years ago. So uh, the, on the left, we've got an example of what a model output can look like. So um, this one is um, an example output of the Eurasian ice sheet over several thousand years, and it shows the ice extent and also the surface velocities at those different time points. So the issues with numerical modeling is that they take a very long time to run and contain high uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty often comes with, um, you have a set of input parameters you have to include in your numerical models. Um, things like um, parameters for this like sliding laws and ice flow laws. Um, so this is where our uncertainty comes from because these are not um, known explicitly. Um, they're also computationally expensive. Um, we want to model the whole Eurasian ice sheet, which covers a large area of Europe and Asia over 30,000 years. So each run takes a long time and they currently don't take into account the data. So our aim is to use the data to learn about the model input parameters and to create an optimal model. To do this, we want to use emulators. Um, so emulators are a way that we can take a small number of model simulations and use those to predict thousands. Um, we'll use a Gaussian process emulator, um, which starts by taking a prior, which um, you can see in this top image here, just some samples of a, a generic prior, and then use the observations, which are the crosses in this uh, short example, um, to update the posterior distribution to make it fit the data a lot better. So we'll use this sort of framework in combination with a history matching process, which um, is a way of scoring how well a certain input can give you a certain output um, to narrow down our input parameter space. We need an output to train the emulator, which is where we want to incorporate using the physical evidence that we have available. Uh, I have a more detailed approach of this on my poster, but as I've only got 10 minutes, I want to focus on other things for now. So we have three main types of evidence. Um, the evidence is not direct, so it can't tell us how um, thick the ice is, for example, or um, the speed of the ice sheet traveling, um, but it can give us indications of how um, the ice sheet moved over time. So we've got three main types. We've got drumlins, which are pictured in the top left, which are these hills. Um, they're laid down as the ice sheet is moving, so they tend to form parallel to the ice flow. Um, so for example, in this picture, um, the flow would be going from bottom left to top right. Um, so that's a good indication of the flow direction. We've also got moraines, um, which are ridges, like pictured on the bottom part of this picture here. Um, their ridges laid down at the front of the ice sheet. So when the ice sheet is stationary, it drops the deposits and these ridges are formed. So it can give us an idea of an ice extent at certain points in time. And then we've also got geochronological evidence such as radiocarbon dates and OSL dates. Um, this indicates when um, the ice sheet couldn't have been covering it. So ice free timings. So what we want to do is compare the model, each model run that we do 
to uh, the data to see how well the model um, compares to the data. Um, there are already tools available for doing this for each of the three types of data, but they are quite statistically primitive. Um, they also only give a binary output, so they either tell us whether it fits or doesn't fit the data, um, which does not suit emulation as we need more of a graded approach to um, score the model runs more sequentially. So we've been looking to start with at updating the flow direction tool, so the one that compares drumlins to the model um, simulations. So currently, um, the tool uh, available just compares the observed and modeled flow directions and takes that difference in angles and sums that across the whole ice sheet for each of the different drumlins. And then the run is either kept or rejected based on a, an agreement threshold. We want to create a new tool that uses the von Mies distribution, which is a circular analog of the normal distribution um, to compare the angle distance difference to this distribution and form a likelihood score for each run. Um, I've got an example of on the right here, the gray lines are the modeled flow direction um, given by the numerical model. And then these black lines are um, groups of drumlins called flow sets, which indicate the observed um, flow direction. Um, for this tool, we're going to assume that the drumlins have an equal probability at forming at each time point. Um, we can't date drumlins because they formed under the ice sheet, so this is our best assumption for now. So I've done a very simple toy example just to show how this toy, uh, how this tool works. So in the top right here, I've got uh, an example of three model outputs where the black ovals are the drum lens with the black arrow indicating the observed flow direction. And then the blue arrows are the different flow directions at each time point um, from a model simulation with the difference in angles below. So we have three time slices. So we've got a third probability of the drum lens forming at each time point. And then we compare each of these differences to the von Mies distribution and get the corresponding values. And then we can score this model run um, by multiplying each by a third and adding together to give an approximate um, likelihood score for this model run of 0.41. So that's in basis how the tool works. Um, to extend this slightly, um, we know that faster ice flow means that drumlins tend to lie very parallel to ice flow, whereas when it, the ice is flowing slower, there's more variation in the drumlins, so it might not be quite parallel to um, ice flow. So to account for this, we are going to alter the precision parameter dependent on the speed of the ice. So the precision parameter in the von Mies distribution is equivalent to one over the variance in a normal distribution. Um, so when the ice is flowing faster, we want to use a higher precision parameter so that um, the model has to be more accurate to score higher. And when the ice is flowing slower, we want to use a wider distribution so that it can still score highly, even if it's slightly um, off. Um, we will be taking real observations um, from Antarctica for local variation in ice flow um, that we can use to work out um, the pre precisions for the different speeds. So in summary, um, Numerical modeling is important to help us predict future sea level rise. Um, there's lots of data readily available, um, but it's very rarely incorporated into the modeling techniques. Um, we will build new tools for model data comparison using a likelihood output. Uh, so we will um, also create tools for the marines and geochronological evidence. And then we will use this output in an emulation framework to find the optimal model input parameters and hopefully create a good numerical model reconstruction of the last Eurasian ice sheet. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie, very much indeed. Perfect timing. Plenty of time for questions and comments if people have them. Um, I'm not sure how Dimitris has been running this, but you can put comments either into the chat or you can Probably, I think there's probably a way to raise your hand, and if you do that, we will try and, and 
identify that you've that you've wished that you've done so. So speak up somehow if you have a question or a comment. Okay, so apparently we only have chat facilities. Okay, that's fine. Great. Okay, so uh, yes, we can unmute you if you'd like to speak, or you can just type it, type your question in the chat. If you want to be unmuted, let me know, and we will do that for you. And I've got Dimitris here helping me very kindly. Okay, so Rosie, while while other people have a think, I'll ask you a question if that's all right. So what I've what I've always been a bit unsure about, and you know, I've been working on and off in this kind of area myself for quite a long time. I've always been unsure exactly what form the data take for these drumlins. So what can you describe the, the nature and structure of the data that you're working with? Um, so for the drumlin data, I think we mainly just have an angle. Um, that's sort of the main thing that we're going right, to. And that data came to you already as angles, did it? Uh, I'm not, I haven't actually um, handled the data yet. Right, okay. Um, for the drumlins. Okay. And so, and so you're expecting to have some data evidence, as I understood it from your talk, and some drumlins. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, right. we've got um, the moraines as well, which can oh. give us ice extent, but that should, we're hoping that will be enough. Um, I think we've got about 5,500 dates. Um, right. Yeah, there's lots of data scattered throughout the literature. Right. And the dates are all for, presumably, for, for various forms of activity that mean you know that there was no ice when those things were happening. Is that right? Like archaeological evidence, for example. Yeah, so a lot of it's like like radiocarbon dates um, relies on organic matter so that we assume that they can't form under, um, yeah, when under the ice. ice. Yeah, okay. yeah. But also probably it's, if, if there's literally an ice sheet, there won't be much human activity either. So no. coming from human being. Okay, so I think I've probably covered my question. So does anybody else have any questions now? Questions or comments? If you're working in a similar area and you'd like to make a comment, that would be fine too. Okay, Rosie, looks like you've been very clear to me. I had another quick question, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, I can't hear you either. So let me see if I can hear the voice, but I can't hear it very it, loudly. Let me see if I can. It's Bryony, sorry. Hi, Bryony. Assuming Rosie can hear you, just go ahead, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was just wondering, you mentioned that you have different kind of comparison tools for different types of data. So what is it that changed in the data that means that they require different kind of com different metrics for comparison? If yeah, so, <laughs> so we've got three different tools, but for the three different types of physical evidence. So one for drumlins, one for moraines, and one for the dates. Um, so yeah, they have to be handled slightly differently. So that's why we've got three different ones. 